Hey guys, thanks for taking the time to click on this video. I hope you can take something away and learn something awesome from this. Um, in this particular presentation, I'll be covering the history of the Hebrew language and script. Let's get to it. I want to refer here to a few sources that I'm using um, that were of particular importance for this project. Um, the first one here is a history of the Hebrew language. And as I'm citing this, I just call it HHL. This book was also really awesome. It's called The Book of Hebrew Script. I'm referring to this one as BHS. The Handbook of Hebrew Calligraphy as HHC. There's also this really cool guy, his name is Jeffrey Benner, and he creates this um, thing. It's called Ancient Hebrew Research Center. And he has a little article that I pulled um, some information from. So also um, Jeffrey Benner. The Dead Sea Scrolls Library is also really helpful. I I usually, I usually use it in like all my projects, um, so super great source, definitely recommend. And lastly, there was an article that I just stumbled across, it's called Kata Biblon, and they go really in depth on the uh, Phoenician origin, um, as well as some other stuff, but I use a lot of images on the uh, Proto-Sinatic and Paleo-Hebrew um, discoveries they found, so super useful. Awesome, so let's just really begin uh, with the simple question, what is Hebrew? So Hebrew is classified as a Northwest Semitic language, consisting of a purely consonantal alphabet, as are all Semitic languages. As a language, it also falls under the classification of Canaanite. But with Canaanite, that also brings up the question, what is it, right? So within the Canaanite group, and very close to Hebrew in terms of geography and linguistic characteristics, are Phoenician in the middle of the Northwest Semitic area, Ammonite, Edomite, Moabite to the South all known from the beginning of the first millennium BC. Ugaritic is also known um, and classified by some people to be Semitic, but for the case of this book, I just pulled um, these four. When did Hebrew begin to develop then? Four and a half thousand years ago in the Northeast, Old Akkadian replaced Sumerian, a non-Semitic language, which influenced Akkadian in a number of ways, and from which Akkadian borrowed its system of cuneiform writing. In the second millennium BC, while well, in the northeast, Akkadian split into the Babylonian and Assyrian dialects. An area further to the west witnessed the rise of Amorite and later Ugaritic, and other languages known through the proto canaanite inscriptions from Byblos, Sinai, and El Armana glosses. At the close of the second millennium, differences between two families, Canaanite, including Hebrew, and Aramaic, became more pronounced, and both developed independently throughout the first millennium. On the same question, when did Hebrew begin to develop? The common view is that the first division within the Semitic area happened before 3000 BCE, separating Northeast Semitic Kadian from the rest. It seems likely that before 2000 BCE, West Semitic had already split into two branches, Northern and Southern. At the end of the second millennium, the Canaanite and Aramaic groups emerged within the Northwest Semitic. In the South, differences developed among Arabic, North Arabian, South Arabian and Ethiopic. Each of these branches eventually evolved into the language and dialects we know today. It is difficult to date exactly when Hebrew became its own language, considering that cognates and other linguistic features were shared by different Canaanite languages. Hebrew in its emerging state falls into what is referred to as an isogloss, a line on a map marking the limits of an area within which a feature of speech occurs as the use of a particular word or pronunciation. So one way I like to think of it is Spanglish. In its early form, Hebrew was like Spanglish, but composed of Aramaic and other Canaanite languages. Um, so imagine maybe you go south of the border and you find people who speak both Spanish and English um, interchangeably throughout their sentences. Now for those particular people, um, you fast forward in time, um, let's say they become more isolated. What they speak would eventually evolve into a language, right? Uh, so Spanglish over time would become its own language. It would evolve into something more exclusive to itself. Um, yeah. So one way I think of it is like pigeon that extended into a crail, where you need to communicate a roles between, you know, two people of different languages, Aramaic and uh, Canaanite or something, became simple and later evolved throughout the generations to become more exclusive to itself, more Hebrew. It seems to have emerged during the end of the second millennium. The language standardized and became more exclusive through the establishment of courts at the first temple 
following the beginning of the first millennium. So the temple, the courts, and the law all helped Hebrew to become um, more of itself, more exclusive to itself as a language. I know that was probably a lot. So here I want to look at three particular stages of Hebrew. Um, so the first here is classical biblical Hebrew, also known as BH, um, but classical biblical Hebrew. The second is LBH, which is late biblical Hebrew, and RH, which is rabbinical Hebrew. So let's look at CBH. So what really was it, right? It's pre-exilic Hebrew, least influenced by Imperial Aramaic and the other Canaanite languages to come. It's what comes closest to Hebrew. Now with LBH, late biblical Hebrew, I want to take a little bit more time to um, explain because it's a bit more intricate. LBH was used for the closing books of the canon, most of the Deuteron canonical literature, a number of pseudepigraphic and apocalyptic compositions, and the Qumran documents, HHL. So one way I think of LBH is it's a literary reconstruction, partial imitation of CBH as an attempt after exile to preserve CBH's continuity. It is also a modernization bringing up to date archaic forms whilst also introducing Aramaisms. And I'll explain this why in a minute, according to the quotes uh, that I've taken from some of the books I've read. But all in all, LBH is a combination of classical biblical Hebrew and rabbinical Hebrew, which is what we'll get into in a second. So now I want to read a few quotes. Right up to the time of the deconstruction of the first temple, classical Hebrew had continued in use as demonstrated by biblical texts, and especially by inscriptions in Austria reflecting contemporary usage. The exile, which meant an end to the monarchy and led to the breakdown of social structures, signaled a time of profound change, which also significantly affected the way, uh, significantly affected the Hebrew language. In the writings that followed, this event, and this is important, this event um, was an attempt made at first to imitate pre-exilic works, repeating their formulas and vocabulary. A degree of modernization, though, was unavoidable. The impact of the colloquial language is obvious, as is the influence of imperial Aramaic. There are, however, obvious differences of language and style in the various books composed in LBH. In some, great efforts have been made to reproduce the earlier biblical language faithfully, whereas others, we can see clearly traces of the colloquial idiom, an early form of RH. BH, which was always basically a literary idiom, ceased to be a living language in the period following the Babylonian exile, even though it survived in the form of LBH in the later books of the Bible. This was no more than an imitation of pre exilic style. In Jerusalem and Judea, the daily language after the return from exile was no longer BH, but instead a spoken, more demotic dialect. Whether this was an existing, possibly pre exilic Hebrew dialect, a late version of BH developed under the influence of Aramaic, or a type of new common language, probably the first. According to History of Hebrew Language. In sum, the prevailing view is that the Dead Sea Scrolls represent a fundamentally biblical form of language in a late stage of development. Despite religiously motivated opposition, at least in the sect's beginning, the continuation of LBH moved progressively closer to RH and fell under the influence of Aramaic. At the same time, and I believe he means in an isolated form already stated, Qumran Hebrew has certain features characteristic of a living spoken language. So I didn't fully understand what he was trying to say here um, in this book, History of um, Hebrew Language, but I, what I interpret from him is that um, Qumran existed separately from the, the state of affairs happening in the temple and the Pharisees. They were, they, there was a conflict between them. And Qumran was trying to imitate a classical form of biblical Hebrew, which happened to be modernized, but was a modernization independent from the modernization that happened with the Pharisees um, as they were exposed to Aramaic. Um, so it's hard to interpret from him. I don't fully exactly, but what I get is pretty much that. Um, and the Pharisees began to spoke, speak um, a different form of Hebrew that wasn't, um, which ended up not being as much um, classical, but blended into Aramaic and 
um, some other stuff, mostly Aramaic, but yeah, that one's kind of hard to understand fully, but um, if there are any of you out there who know this better and happen to see this, um, email me, man, or something. The Pharisees deliberately avoided LBH, presenting the teaching in the language of the spoken vernacular. Due to their labors, a form of Hebrew would soon develop into a literary language, RH, which would later replace LBH. So the Qumran people, I guess, are speaking a closer form of biblical Hebrew, um, and then opposed and isolated from that is developing um, something that splits from that and develops into a more Aramaic setting to then later evolve into um, uh, rabbinical Hebrew, which we'll get to here in a second. Rabbinical Hebrew, RH. For several centuries, RH remained an exclusively spoken language. From the second century BCE, it was used by the Pharisees for delivering their lessons, and it was the medium in which the teachings of the rabbis were transmitted until they finally attained written form. This is when RH also became a literary language in the first or second century CE. Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Copper Scrolls of the Bar, of the, uh, bar Kochba letters from around 135 CE, are the oldest written examples of RH known. Earlier testimony from Qumran speaks of a blasphemous tongue. This is the one I was talking about earlier, um, which probably refers to the Pharisaic adversarial speaking RH, or at least an early form of RH. All right, I know that may have been a lot, I don't know. Um, I'm going pretty fast. I'm trying to be as concise as possible. Um, so now I just kind of want to take a sec to slow things down and go back in time and look at some proto-synatic inscriptions. So now we'll be looking at the development of the Hebrew script. All right, so found in Wadi El Hol, Egypt, was an inscription dated to the 20th century BC. So now we're going about 4,000 years back in time. Um, this one's really cool. Here's an inscription found in Serbit El Hadim, Sinai. It's a mine entrance inscription, and this one's dated a little later to the 15th century BCE. In Sinai was also found another inscription dated 351, and it's attributed with being the Egyptian god Ptah. It's also dated to the same time period. Also in Sinai, but really cool, was a Sphinx inscription dated to 1180 BCE. It's really cool because you can actually see the proto on the uh, side right there. There's some other inscriptions on the other side, but we'll get to those in a sec. Here are a few drawings presented by um, Ada Yardeni from the uh, Book of Hebrew Script. Um, and these are all um, in the Cairo Museum of Antiquities. From another website, these are drawings that were also found in Serubit al Khadim Sinai. Um, some of the same stuff, just more detailed illustrations. Those were the inscriptions. Now let's look at the proto synatic alphabet, break things down a bit, look at a little bit of the history and um, kind of just what, what it's about, you know? All right, the proto synatic script. Where did the proto synatic script come from? Proto synatic script is theorized to have originated from Egyptian scribes acquainted with hieroglyphic writing. During the middle of the second millennium BC, Egyptian culture began to influence the area, which was Judea. Um, or the, or the land of Judea before Judea was established. The proto synatic script is attributed with originally having approximately 28 to 27 signs. Hebrew now has 22 consonantal letters. Um, so before um, Hebrew adopted the Phoenician script, um, the Phoenicians were writing in this uh, proto synatic script. Um, but by the time it was passed down to the Hebrews, about four of the consonantal um, letters fell out and Hebrew ended up having 22 letters. Um, but this this here is really interesting. In the Proto-Canaanite script, also um, same word for uh, proto synatic same thing, synonym, the lines were written in various directions, upwards, downwards, left, right, backwards, forwards, a way of writing called boustrophedon, meaning ox turn in Greek. It's kind of cool. The posture of the individual letter signs was also irregular, and they could face different directions. proto canaanite is another name for proto synatic script. This slide talks about, I think, the coolest aspect of the uh, proto synatic script. But this script is, this particular script is written what it, in what is called acrophony. Um, it's a style reminiscent of its hieroglyphic roots. 
Acrophony is a script in which each picture is indicated by the first consonant of the noun it describes. Acrophony can also be defined as relating to an alphabet in which the letters derive from pictographs that represent a word beginning with the sound that the letter represents. So it sounds kind of weird, uh, but I'll explain this here. So, for example, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet is bet, bet, right? In Proto-Sinatic, this letter is written in the shape of a tent or house. In Hebrew, bet as a noun actually means house, right? So you have bet the letter, but then you also have bet the house. Thus, one would write the sign in the image of a house to represent the b sound, since bet begins with the b consonant, or the b consonant. What's also really interesting is that Hebraic interpretations of acrophony are popular among modern mystics and allegorists. Um, so what happens a lot today is a lot of people try to, um, I guess, dissect the meaning of a word based on the meaning of each um, single letter. So they compile, I guess, the, um, the general meaning from each particular meaning to make one meaning or something. Um, which is kind of, I can see in, in its earliest roots um, as being passed down from something possibly hieroglyphic, you know, okay, but I think it can get a little bit too analogous um, and then kind of um, obscure some stuff. But yeah, watch out for that stuff when it's like the, the um, you know, the meaning of like a Hebrew word based on its letters, you know, it's kind of sus, but that's another topic. Awesome, so we just finished one of the big aspects of Hebrew in its beginning. Um, now let's look at the second stage um, and some of its inscriptions. So let's look at some Paleo-Hebrew inscriptions. Really cool, a lot of pictures, I like it. So you can tell the script is different and we'll get to the details of the script in a bit, but this here is the Gezer calendar, 10th century BC. This here is the House of Yahweh Temple, Ostraca, 9th century BC. Um, unfortunately, they are not sure if it's a forgery or not because it was found in a private collection. But you can see on the one first second fourth line on the left corner it says Beit Yahweh. So it actually says House of Yahweh, which is pretty cool. This is an ivory pomegranate, first simple object, eighth century BC. So this little tiny thing um, may have resided in the temple, um, which is actually pretty cool. Pretty astounding, actually. Here's some random pieces of ostraca from Samaria, 8th century. This one's actually pretty cool. It's the Siloam inscription dated to the 8th century BC. Here are some fragments of ostraca from Tel Arad, Israel. These are dated to the 6th century BCE. This is from Lachish, Arad, ostraca, 6th century BC. These are um, priestly blessing amulets from Ketefinon, Jerusalem, and they are dated to the 6th century BC. You may actually be able to see some of the Hebrew on them. It was super hard finding, um, like, not super grainy images, but kind of cool. Now, out of this whole presentation, I definitely think this is one of the coolest things um, that I stumbled across in just looking through some findings. Um, but these things are called the boule. And they're little pieces of clay that are indented by a signet ring, um, which would have your name on it. They show um, that this particular object is owned by you, or this particular object has um, been certified by you. Um, and they're typically put on pieces of papyrus, like scrolls or messages, um, to show that they haven't been opened yet and that they were actually, they're not forgeries, they're actually given by you or someone, right? Um, so these are impressions of Hezekiah and Isaiah uh, seals um, from Jerusalem, Israel, 7th century BC. Um, what's crazy is that they're actually, they were actually found um, on the Temple Mount, like right next to the Wailing Wall um, in the same layer of dirt. Um, and I'll get to the same layer of dirt, why I specifically say that in a second. But the first bully on the left says, um, to Isaiah, it's missing the uh, the um, shuruk, um, which is the uh, the vav with the dagesh in it. Shuruk, I think it's shuruk. Yeah, but it says to Isaiah, Yeshua Yao. And this is to Lanav, 
um, and it's missing, they speculate that it's missing an Aleph. It could say Tenovi, which would have been a last name. Um, but some people interpret this as saying to Isaiah the prophet, uh, le, le Yeshua, um, le Yeshua Yahu la Navi, to Isaiah the prophet, which is crazy. And the second belief on the right, um, says to Hezekiah, uh, king. And it says some other stuff, I forget. But it says, uh, Lechezekiah, uh, Melech. Um, so it's crazy because, um, Isaiah and Hezekiah are mentioned in the same, um, 16 verses. Like, in the, in the span of 16 verses, they're mentioned in the same, uh, context. Um, and they're found within the same dirt, uh, like layer. So, which would have meant that, um, these were individuals who lived in the same time period, um, which means that they, you know, they would have been found in that same layer. So it's like, wow, it's kind of crazy if, if, if you know, they're actually legit. You know, it's, it's pretty wild. This here is a half shekel from the Temple Mount Jerusalem, first century AD. Um, what's really peculiar about this is that it was probably the last of its kind in terms of um, when it was minted, um, because it's actually written in the paleo. Um, paleo itself, as you will see later, um, kind of dissipated as a written style of Hebrew around the, um, the end of the first millennium. Um, so it's kind of cool just thinking like, this is probably the last minted type of this coin, uh, which is pretty cool. This is a boule saying, uh, from Nathan, uh, Melech, which is a servant of the king, Nathan Melech, um, Jerusalem, 7th century. BC. And if you actually look this up, there's a scripture which ne uh, mentions um, a servant of the king named Nathan Merlick, which is actually pretty cool. This one is actually also one of my favorite um, like things. I just look at it and I'm like, whoa. It's a blue agate seal uh, found in Jerusalem, Israel, 7th century. Uh, and it says to Ikar, son of Matanyahu. Super cool. It's like a stone with like paleo. How cool does it get? I don't know. Mm. So let's look at some really cool stuff. Um, I got this from the Dead Sea Scrolls Library database. It's an amazing resource. Um, I highly suggest you check it out if you're going to get into Hebrew um, or even just learn about some awesome stuff. So this, let's look at a document, um, 11Q1 um, or 11Q. It's a paleo version of Leviticus. You can see here... Um, how long the scroll was. I mean, look at that. That's like huge. Um, and then here's some other little fragments taken from a plate. Still some other cool stuff. This is a first temple papyrus document. 7th century BCE. Um, papyrus found within the first temple period is not super common. Um, so it's very interesting finding this one. Super cool also. So this one is a first temple papyrus document as well from the 7th century BC, also from uh, Wadi Murabaat, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, but it's ancient Hebrew papyrus with the earliest reference to Jerusalem outside of the Bible, which is kind of cool. The 11 centimeter by 2.5 centimeter piece of papyrus includes two lines of ancient Hebrew script. Most of the letters are clearly legible. It specifies the sender of the shipment, the king's maidservant, the name of the settlement from where it was sent, the contents and amount of the shipment, wine, and the destination, Jerusalem. At the time, Jerusalem was the capital of the city of the kingdom. Kind of cool because it's like a receipt. It's like almost 3,000 like years old, yeah, 3,000, a little less than 3,000 years old, crazy. It's kind of funny too, because you think about the king, you know, he's just trying to like drink some wine, and then it ends up being like a receipt that's like super valuable in like 2,000 years. It's like going to like Walmart or something, just getting something casual, and then, you know, you lose that, and then a 1,000 years later, someone's studying that, and it's super, yeah, it's just super valuable. It's like kind of ironic or something, you know. Shit's like trash to treasure. I don't know. But it's kind of cool at the same time. Right. So 
let's look at the Pelu Hebrew script, um, kind of get more in depth on what it is and kind of what it's about. Towards the middle of the 11th century BC, Canaanite hieroglyphs turned into linear letter signs. That is, each letter was made up of a small number of lines, either straight or bent, and the pictures have become abstract forms. It's interesting, like, these hieroglyphs um, over time just evolved into something else, and it was um, eventually just became obscured into something new. The origin of Paleo Hebrew script is Phoenician. However, the characters differ in that of the curving to the left of the downstrokes and the long-legged letter signs. So the long the long strokes pretty much just are um, they 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 face like left pretty much. Um, the X-shaped top, which you can see there, and the valve with the concave top. Um, yeah. This slide is pretty cool. It presents some information on really just why I appreciate Hebrew in general. Um, but ancient Jewish literary sources refer to the script as Da'atz, Ra'atz, Katavivri, or pre babylonian script, as Pelu. Ra'atz is taken from the verb to break or shatter, figuratively referring to a jagged script. So Ra'atz means practically jagged. But here's what's cool. Here's what's interesting. The cool thought is that a runner, Ra'at, you can hear the same phonology in Hebrew, shares association with the verb Ratsa, to break, to shatter, because messages were written and sent upon broken ostraca when papyrus was not accessible. So a way of thinking about this Hebraic concept in English is kind of to think of a runner as a brokener in a way. It sounds kind of funny, but when someone needed to send a message and papyrus was not around, they'd just pick up a broken piece of pottery, write on it, and run it to the next you know, town or station. Is uh, pretty cool. It's pretty cool. After the Babylonian exile, Pelu Hebrew began to be replaced with the Ashurit Assyrian script, also known as the Aramaic square script. Pelu Hebrew subsequently began to fall out of use after the destruction of the first temple, 586, up until the end of the first millennium. Um, so when I mentioned that shekel earlier, why it's interesting is that um, it's 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 peculiar that a coin written in that style would be found so late in history, um, which is probably one of the few last minted coins to ever be written in that script, which is pretty cool. And lastly, I just wanted to show you guys one of my tattoos, which is inspired from the same script. And I got it a few months back, but um, I made it myself, stylized it, and um, it's really cool. So yeah, let's move on to the next section. All right, let's look at the Samaritan script. The Pelu Hebrew script was passed down to the Samaritans through both the Torah and the Samaritan Aramaic dialect. So Paleo Hebrew did not end in its evolution as it did with the Jews. Um, the, the Samaritans were able to keep it alive and eventually um, it did change a little bit as you'll see in the next slide, um, but they were able to preserve and maintain that same writing style um, and allow it to evolve into something a little bit uh, different, which is pretty interesting. Here is an image from the Samaritan Pentateuch, and as you can see, it partially looks like the Paleo Hebrew. Um, this is from the 12th century AD, and there's not a lot of in between um, documents to portray the, the full evolution, but it's pretty cool that the Samaritans were able to retain that. There's also this dude just straight chilling with the straw, looking cool. So this is a different section. This covers Canaanite inscriptions. And under Canaanite, we looked over this a little bit, but it's it encompasses Phoenician, Moabite, Aramaic, um, and a few other uh, things like uh, Hittite and Ugaritic. But uh, yeah, let's look at some some inscriptions. This is the House of David Telgan. Aramaic inscription, 9th century BC, and you can see um, in white, it says Beit David, pretty dope, House of David. The Moabite Mesha, 9th century BC. The Kilamua Phoenician inscription, 9th century BC. The Hamilk seal, 5th century BC. The Blos. These two are really fascinating. 
They are Arslan Tash amulets, 81 and 82, dated from the 7th century BC. And they are in Phoenician, if I'm not mistaken. Phoenician script, of course, uh, the Phoenician language. And they are um, cantonations for like warding off bad spirits um, and like some other magic kind of stuff. But uh, just, just interesting, really fascinating. Here is a bronze bottle from Tel Siran. This is the 7th century BC. El Karak inscription, 9th century BCE. The Elibal inscription, 10th century BCE. Biblos as well, Sidon. I love this one. This one's super cool. Um, you can see the paleo on the bottom. Uh, or not the paleo, my bad. The Phoenician. And then you can see some hieroglyphs above it. Um, but it's a Phoenician tablet sarcophagus um, inscription, 5th century BCE. Super dope. These are Fergi gold tablets, Phoenician and Etruscan. 5th century BCE. Crazy. Alright, we are at the last um, section, and this is the Aramaic square script, the last part of the evolution of Hebrew. At the beginning of the 6th century BCE, Judea was situated between the two dominant superpowers of that period, Babylon in the Middle East and Egypt in the Southwest. Egypt's attempts to take over Mesopotamia by an alliance with Assyria at the end of 7th century BC compelled the rulers of Babylon to conduct a series of campaigns against Egypt. This confrontation caused a political crisis in Judea, which had become a thoroughfare for the Babylonian army. It resulted in the destruction of the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar's army in 586 BCE, and the exile to Babylon of a major part of the urban population, the upper classes, the priesthood, and Judea's ruling families. The urban lower classes and the rural population remained in the country. The Jews who were exiled to Babylon were influenced by their environment, and so began speaking and writing Aramaic in order to communicate with their neighbors and for the writing of official documents. Using the new Aramaic script probably served as a means for unifying the people in order to revitalize comprehension for the majority of exiles and thus preserve the remnant. The square script has been the dominant script of Hebrew. It has spanned to the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls to modern Israeli. There are variants of the script such as when written in varieties of cursive, but square script has been reused the longest. All right, let's finish up with a few pictures of the Aramaic square script. Um, this one in particular I like a lot because it's Genesis 1. So you just read it and it just begins. And fortunately, you can't really see where it says uh, Bereshit bara, but you can see the Elohim, Beta Shamaim, and all the rest. Um, but this one's really cool. This is 11Q Psalms A. Um, Herodian period, and you can actually see, so it's in the Aramaic square, but you can actually see the Paleo Hebrew um, retained when they write, you know, the holy name of God, Yahweh. Um, so they they preserve Yahweh's name in that script, which is pretty cool. And they do the same thing in um, Greek manuscripts as well, a few of the Greek, but really cool. This is from the Aleppo Codex, 10th century BCE. This codex is really decorated. It's a beautiful one, um, but this is the Westminster Leningrad Codex, 10th century CE, 1008. Um, super cool. It's a really cool one. You should look it up, check out the pictures. It's really beautiful. So out of the styles of Aramaic script, um, this was this this one's written in the um, Ashkenazi script, um, and it's uh, the bird's head Haggadah. 13th century AD um, little manuscript piece, but really cool. Favorite type. I believe it's all, it's also classified as the Eastern script, um, even though this one is found in Germany. So I don't know exactly how that works, but I like the script, so that's probably my favorite type. Also, super beautiful, like, writing style. Um, probably even more than the last one. Um, Super dope. Like the olives and like the the roshes and like you know, some of those last letters are like lengthened and it's really cool how it like curves to the left. Just really like really nice. This is the modern Sephardi stam script. Um yeah. Stam, really cool. You can see um you can see these strokes at the top of some of the letters. Those are referred to as keter. They're like which means just crown in Hebrew. Um and it's associated with a little bit of um 
Kabbalistic um, kind of mystic stuff when you get into some of that um, Jewish, some of those Jewish circles. But um, yeah, Keter, Ashkenazi stuff. Pretty cool. Yeah. And lastly, um, this is a, um, okay, so the, my Hebrew Bible, this is my Hebrew Bible. And this one is the Tammy Frank CLM typewriter script. Um, I guess I'm just getting super specific, but uh, this is a picture of my Hebrew Bible, that script. And then I have my uh, Petrangelo Tuco just like chilling on it. So it's like two of my favorite things at once. But yeah, that's all the, all the Hebrew there is. And of course, as always, the work cited, just in case anyone out there tries to sue or cancel me or something. Um, but yeah, it's all in the docs.